بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and today we want to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name, Al-Mujib. Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who responds. Who is Al-Mujib? You know when you make wudu and you raise your hand and you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and you repeat your dua two times, three times, a hundred times and you begin to cry and you're affected and you beg Allah azza wa jal. The question is, who are you making dua to? Who are you calling? You need to know this name. You need to know who you're calling out to before you call out to him. And we are in need to discuss the name of Allah Azza wa Jal Al-Mujib before Ramadan. And Ramadan is only two weeks away. And there's a lot of opportunities in this month. Forgiveness of all past sins. Where every night there is freedom from the fire. And earning high levels and ranks with Allah Azza wa Jal. And an, an opportunity for self-control and increasing in your worship and every day an accepted dua. Allah Azza wa Jal and his angels are sending their prayers upon those who have a suhoor, ulaylat al-qadr and so much more. However, before you can all earn all this, we need to start with the word Ya Rabb. We need to start by making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are in need of asking him subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all this possible for us. Therefore, we need to explore the name of Allah, Al-Mujib, the one who responds. My brothers and sisters in Islam, imagine you're standing on an ice cold freezing land and it's extremely cold and you're clothed well against the cold. And all of a sudden you see a young boy and he's barely clothed and he walks to you and he asks you for a jacket. Would you hesitate to give him a jacket? And you know that the jacket, if you, you have enough clothes, if you gave him a jacket, you know that it will keep him warm and safe from the cold. Would you hesitate? You wouldn't. Why not? Because you're an adult and he's a kid. You're strong and he's weak. You're able to give him a jacket and he's not able to obtain one. And your kindness will overtake and you'll give him one. You'll be shy and embarrassed to walk off and not to answer this boy. And to Allah Azza wa Jal belongs the highest of examples. Imagine then Allah Al-Mujib. Why wouldn't he respond? Why wouldn't he respond to you when in fact he's Al-Qawi? He's the Almighty. And we're the ones that are weak. And he's the capable Al-Qadir. And we're the ones that are powerless. And he's Al-Ghani, Al-Kareem, Al-Mughni, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one that's generous and the one that's rich and the one who enriches. And to him belongs all things. And we are the ones that are poor. We're the ones that have nothing. We don't owe anything. Antumul fuqara'u ilallah, as Allah Azza wa Jal, he says. And he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is al hayyul kareem. He is the one who is shy. And he is generous. He is shy. When the slave raises his hand to him, that he return them zero and empty. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Al-Mujib. My brothers and sisters in Islam, yani Allah Azza wa Jal, he calls himself Al-Mujib, the responder. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي When my servants ask you about me, whenever my servants ask you about me, yani the idea is, when are you going to ask about Allah? You see, this is what Allah says in the Quran. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي Meaning what's expected from the servants is that they ask about Allah. That's what's expected, that they ask about Allah Azza wa Jal. The answer came quick, فَإِنِّي قريب. If they were to ever ask you about me. If anyone is asking about Allah Azza wa Jal, the first knowledge you need to know about Allah, فَإِنِّي قريب. That he is close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دعان. I answer the call, the call, da'wata, one call. Yani not even one call is going to go unresponded to or unanswered. 
I answer the one call of the caller whenever he calls. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallah Azza wa Jalla says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ ادْعُونِي And your Lord said, supplicate to me, astajib lakum. See this word, astajib lakum. Why? He will respond because his name is Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from his attributes is Al-Ijabah. وصالح عليه السلام. He says to his people, when he began to explain to them Allah and talk to them about Allah, he said to them, Inna Rabbi Qareebun Mujib. My Lord is close and he responds. You know, because sometimes there are close people in your life. You request something, they don't answer you. But Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who is close and he will answer as well. And why does Allah Azza wa Jal call himself Al Mujib? Why does he call himself Al Mujib? So that you and I can always be inspired and motivated to ask him. Because you know, when you know he responds, and you're certain of this, when you're certain of his name, Al-Mujib, the one who responds, then you will always be encouraged and motivated to ask him. And I'll tell you something. You know, there's a lot of billionaires and millionaires on earth. Why haven't you ever sent them an email requesting a large sum of money from them? Or why haven't you sent them an email requesting a service from them? You know why? Because you know they will not respond. You know that they will not respond. They are not Al-Mujib. Your message will go unanswered. It will be ignored. So that's why people don't message these people and don't request anything from them. The message is going to go unanswered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself calls himself Al-Mujib so that you and I can be confident and motivated every single time we ask him. This is not going to be a request that's going to go unanswered and fall on deaf ears. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He called himself Al-Mujib, the one who responds. And what does that do? Automatically, it instills confidence and encouragement and motivation in a person that he continue asking Allah azza wa jal. Because now you know that every single request, no matter how small or big it is, Allah Azza wa Jal is going to listen to it. And this is why, and answer it as well. And this is why Umar radiallahu anhu, he used to say, He used to say, I am not concerned and worried about the response of Allah. I don't care about this. I know that Allah would respond. I don't doubt this matter. However, my greatest concern and my greatest worry is about making dua and always making dua and never giving up on it. This is Umar radiallahu anhu saying, when you call out to Allah azza wa jal, do you know who you are calling out to? You know Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I give you an example on the day of Arafah. Four million plus people are standing on the plains of Arafah. For six hours, everyone is making hundreds and hundreds of dua, all at the same time, all in different languages. Millions of requests are going up to Allah Azza wa Jal within a few hours from Arafah. And this is besides the people all around the world that are supplicating to Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of Arafah. And all these people, he hears them subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is a Samir. Even though they are calling at the same time in different languages. And some crying out loud and some silently the one sitting next to him cannot even hear what he is saying. And Allah Azza wa Jal not only hears them all, He answers them all, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know who you're calling out to? When you say, Ya Rabb, and you begin to speak what you're speaking and requesting, the entire inhabitants of the seven heavens, billions and billions of angels, are also supplicating Allah Azza wa Jal every day. Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Rahman, He says, Yas'aluhu man fi samawati wal ardi kulla yawmin huwa fi sha'n. Every single day, angels and people on earth are asking Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He says about Himself, كُلَّ يَوْمْ هُوَ فِي شَأْنٍ Every single day, He's involved in an affair. What does that mean? Yani every single day, He's giving. And every day, He's forgiving. And every day, He's accepting repentance. And every day, He's guiding people. And every day, He's sending His provisions upon people, upon animals. He's keeping this entire universe in maintenance and in existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you enter Al-Masjid, for example, Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca, during Ramadan, millions 
are standing, raising their hands, making dua to Allah. Wallah, if you've ever entered there, your heart trembles and it shakes from the power and the honor of this gathering. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is listening to all this and he's answering each and every single one of them. This is why Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he used to have a ring in his finger. He used to wear a ring. And on the ring, there was written on it, Ni'mal Qadirullah. Ni'mal Qadirullah. How excellent is it that Allah Azza wa Jal is capable over all things. Allahu Akbar. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was connected every moment of his life with the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do whatever he wants. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in a hadith, that Allah said, Ya ibadi, kullukum dal. Oh my servants, all of you are misguided. Not just the heavy sinner, not just the one who's watching haram now, and not just the one who is alone with a non-mahram woman, and not just the drug addict and the alcoholic. Kullukum, all of you are misguided. Each and every single one of you. Illa man hadaytuh except who I have chosen to guide. So what's the solution, Ya Rabb? The hadith says, فَاسْتَهْدُونِي Seek my guidance. Ask me for my guidance. And what would Allah Azza wa do since he's Al-Mujib? أَهْدِكُمْ I will guide you. Seek my guidance. This is the solution. اللَّهُمَّ اهْدِنَا This is the solution. بالصلاه, this is why اهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ المستقيم At least 17 times a day. This is the solution for every sinner, for every drug addict, for every alcoholic, for every woman that cannot find energy and strength to adhere to al-hijab, to every person tested with arrogance and jealousy and hypocrisy. This is the solution. فَاسْتَهْدُونِي Seek my guidance. This is the solution if your children were misguided and you're worried about them. This is the solution if your wife or your husband were misguided. فَاسْتَهْدُونِي Seek my guidance, ahdikum, I will guide you. Why? Because he's al-mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same hadith, then Allah azza wa jalla, he says, Ya ibadi, kullukum ja'irun. Oh my slaves, all of you are hungry. All of you. The one who has a million dollars is still hungry. The one who ate today and the one who did not eat today, they're both hungry. The one who came with a hundred thousand dollar car, kullukum ja'irun. All of you are hungry. The one who came by train and the one who came walking. كُلُّكُمْ جَائِعٌ All of you are hungry. إِلَّا مَنْ أَطْعَمْتُهُ Except the one who I provided for. What's the solution? If we're all going to be hungry and it is only Allah who provides for us, what is the solution then? فَاسْتَطْعِمُونِي Seek my provision. Ask me for my provision. If you want to get married, seek it from Allah. If you want a house to live in, seek it from Allah. If you want an increase in your income, seek it from Allah. People are worried today and the cost of living is going up and this is worrying people. When Allah Azza wa Jalla has already said, Kullukum jai'un. doesn't matter whether the price goes up or cost of living goes up or goes down. Was it going to change anything? It does not change the fact that Kullukum jai'un. all of you are hungry and you thought that you're feeding yourself with your own hands and your own effort and your strength and your power. Impossible. فَاسْتَطْعِمُونِي What's the solution then if we're all going to go hungry? فَاسْتَطْعِمُونِي Seek your provision from me. When was the last time you raised your hand? And you said, اللَّهُمَّ ارْزُقْنَا رِزْقًا حَلَالًا اللَّهُمَّ اكْفِنَا بِحَلَالِكَ عَنْ حَرَامِكَ When was the last time? So what was the solution? إِلَّا فَاسْتَطْعِمُونِي What's the answer? أُطْعِمْكُمْ I will feed you. I will provide for you. Why? Because he's Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why those who don't know who Al-Mujib is, they commit suicide at the end. The one who killed himself because he lost his savings. And the one who killed himself and killed his children because of fear of poverty. And the one who threw his children in the bin because of poverty. All these people did not know who Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala is. They did not know who Allah azza wa jal is. In the same hadith, then Allah azza wa jal, he says, Ya ibadi, kullukum arin. All of you are naked. All of you. The one who's wearing a $5 shirt and the one who's wearing a $100 shirt. All of you are naked. إِلَّا مَنْ كَسَوْتُهُ Except who I have clothed. فَاسْتَكْسُونِي أَكْسُكُمْ This is the solution. فَاسْتَكْسُونِي Seek your clothing from me. Ask me for clothing. Ask me that I cover you. 
And this is why it is a good dua for the one who always finds himself exposing his aura of men and women. A woman that struggles to wear al-hijab should adhere to a, a, a dua that is known in the uh, Adhkar al-Sabah wa al-Masa. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is taught that we make a dua in Adhkar al-Sabah wa al-Masa. Allahumma stur awrati. Oh Allah, cover my privates. Cover my aura. You see this? This is found in Adhkar al-Sabah wa al-Masa. The one who finds himself always uncovering his aura and he cannot cover his aura, make this dua. Allahumma stur awrati. Because you chose to be naked or you chose to uncover your aura. Wallah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who clothes. Fastaksuni. What's the result? Aksukum. I will clothe you. I'll cover your aura. Because he's Al Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same hadith, Ya Ibadi. Innakum tuhtiuna bil layli wa nahar. You all commit sins and transgression every single night and day. إِنَّكُمْ تُخْطِئُونَ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ All of you, in the day and in the night. وَأَنَا أَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا What's the solution then? That no, our sins are going to destroy us. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla, He said, And I'm the one who forgives all sins. فَاسْتَغْفِرُونِي Seek my forgiveness. أَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ I will forgive you because He is Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was approached by a man with a sword, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sleeping under a tree. And all of a sudden he woke up to a man carrying a sword in front of him. And this man said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Man yamna'uka minni? Who will prevent you from me? Who will, who will stop me from you now approaching you and killing you? For the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allah, 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 three times. And the sword in this disbeliever's hand fell. شوف المجيب سبحانه وتعالى he only heard the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم saying Allah والله سبحانه وتعالى rushed to his aid when the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم was affected by magic imagine someone now you know imagine someone now he's told that yes indeed you are a person who is a victim of magic you have been affected by magic what happens to you people become depressed I've seen in my life people become depressed and miserable طيب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم what was his solution in the same hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari فدعا ثم دعا ثم دعا 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 and then he was cured Allah عز وجل revealed قل أعوذ برب الفلق قل أعوذ برب الناس والله سبحانه وتعالى cured him الدعاء لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم knows that this matter is in Allah's hand Allah al-Mujib and he answers the way he wants سبحانه وتعالى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم would make دعاء when he goes into the masjid, when he leaves the masjid, when he sleeps, when he wakes up, when he enters the bathroom, when he leaves, when he makes wudu, when he's in distress, he would say, Allahumma rahmataka arju fala takilni ila nafsi tarfata ayn. When he faces the enemy, he will make dua, Allahumma inna naj'aluka fi nuhurihim, and so on. 24-7 dua at every occasion. That why? لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم is living with the name of Allah المجيب he's living this is a sign that a person believes in Allah's name المجيب when all his affairs of the day and the night are in dua the mother of Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه was a disbeliever and she was very abusive towards Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه فأبو هريرة went to the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم and he said يا رسول الله can you make دعاء that Allah guide my mother فالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم said اللهم اهدي أم أبي هريرة oh Allah guide the mother of Abu هريرة so then Abu هريرة was excited with this دعاء and he left the presence of the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم and he rushed back to his house he said فلما جئت فصرت إلى الباب فإذا هو مجاف he arrived to the door of his house and it was closed. فسمعت أمي خشف قدمي And his mother heard him coming. So she said to him, مكانك يا أبا هريرة Stop where you are, do not enter. Then Abu هريرة said, وسمعت خضخضة الماء I heard the trickling of water. She was making ghusl. Then she opened the door and she walked out and she said, يا أبا هريرة أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله She accepted Islam. 
She was guided bi du'a'i Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see the example of Allah azza wa jal being al-mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. And he was crying. He was crying out of excitement. And he rushed back to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said to Rasulullah, Abshir, Abu Huraira said to Rasulullah, listen to this. He said to him, congratulations ya Rasulullah. Faqad istajab Allahu da'watak. Allah has answered your dua. Al-Mujib. People were living with the name of Allah, Al-Mujib. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu was quick. He was very quick to tie the entire event with Allah's name, Al-Mujib. He knows it wasn't his effort. It wasn't anyone's effort. He quickly said that Allah has answered your dua. Subhanallah. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to praise Allah and speak good. Umar radiallahu anhu was an accepted dua. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mecca, he says, Allahumma hdi ahabba al-umarayni ilayk. Guide one of the two most beloved Umars to you. And it was Umar radiallahu anhu who then became a Muslim. لأن الله سبحانه وتعالى المجيب and he answered this dua of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم the tribe of دوس you know طفيل أبن عمر الدوسي رضي الله عنه him and his tribe a few men they came to رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and they said يا رسول الله إن دوسا عصت وأبت that the tribe of دوس have become horrible they have disobeyed every command and they have rejected and refused any message of the guidance. فَادْعُوا اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِمْ Make dua against them, Ya Rasulullah. فَالنَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Or those that were around, they said, هَلَكَ الدَّوْسِ That's it, Dos is going to be destroyed. So he said, Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم made dua against them, they are gone. فَالنَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم He said, اللَّهُمَّ هَدِّ دَوْسًا وَأْتِ بِهِمْ Oh Allah, guide the tribe of Dos and bring them. يعني bring them here to Al Madina as migrants. And this happened in the lifetime of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they all accepted Islam. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes a dua. He says, Allahumma faqihhu fi al-deen wa'allimhu al-ta'weel. Give him the understanding of a deen Oh Allah, grant him an understanding of a deen and teach him the interpretation of your book. And he became turjuman al-Qur'an. He became the most famous interpreter of the Qur'an. Through a dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Lain Allah azza wa jal is al-mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make his dua, he knows Allah is al-mujib. Allah azza wa jal answers the way he wants. Um Salama radiyallahu anha. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam proposed to her, he wanted to marry her. After Abu Salama had died and she finished her adda, he went to her proposing to her. And she refused initially. Allahu Akbar, she refused. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she had three concerns. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm an old woman. And I have kids, and I'm a jealous woman. Inni mar'atun shadeedatul ghayra. Allahu Akbar, when a woman, when a woman's jealousy passes the limit, and a man wants to marry a second, his life becomes miserable. And I've seen it with my own eyes, how things become extremely complicated. So how did the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam respond to this concern of hers? Number one, he says, Ana akbaru minki sinnan. I'm older than you. So don't worry about the first one. وَالْعِيَالُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ And your children are on Allah and His Messenger. يعني your children are my children. I'll look after him. Listen to this now. وَأَمَّا مَا ذَكَرْتِ مِنْ غَيْرَتِكِ And what you mentioned about your jealousy, فَإِنِّي أَدْعُوا اللَّهَ أَنْ يُذْهِبَهَا عَنْكِ I will ask and supplicate and make dua to Allah that he rid you of this jealousy. And it was gone. And he married her sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For if you intend to practice polygamy, then do not ignore the jealousy of the first wife. He is a prophetic solution, a dua. The main thing is that the wife says, Ameen. And this is the main thing. Well, in the story of Maryam alayhi salam as Allah azza wa jal mentions in the Quran when she was approached by Jibreel or Jibreel had approached her she had no idea who he is she said inni a'udhu bil rahmani mink I seek protection of the most merciful from you I ask Allah to protect me from you yani in other words so keep away and do not come near me before Allah destroys you she didn't know who, she, who he was this is as-saliheen Maryam alayhi salam 
This is her weapon, a dua. Why? Why did she say these few words? And she didn't say to him, listen, I have a family behind me. I have a tribe that will come and they'll defend me and they'll protect me. Now, what are they going to do for you? And she knows. Okay, she has a tribe, she has family, but they're not guaranteed to be mujib at every second in your life and respond to your call and your cry at every second in your life. Lakin Allah Azza wa Jal is al-mujib. So she rushed to say, say these words. Um Musa alayhi salam, when Fir'aun sends an order wanting to kill Musa, Fir'aun, he said, as Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ ذَرُونِي أَقْتُ الْمُوسَى he said to his people, leave me. Let me go. Let me go and kill Musa. Who the thing is, no one was holding him back. But when he said this, he said it to make it like, and no, look, and I'm strong. You people are holding me back. But in reality, he was scared and terrified to harm Musa alayhi salam. He had seen the truth. And he knows what Musa alayhi salam has come with is the truth. But it was his arrogance that held him back from accepting the truth. So he put the blame on his people and he said, leave me. Let me go. Musa alayhi salam, what did he say when this message reached him and this uh, call from Fir'aun reached him? He said, as Allah Azza wa said in the Quran, وَقَالَ مُوسَىٰ إِنِّي عُذْتُ بِرَبِّي وَرَبِّكُمْ مِن كُلِّ مُتَكَبِّرٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُ بِيَوْمِ الْحِسَابِ He said, إِنِّي عُذْتُ بِرَبِّي وَرَبِّكُمْ I'm seeking my protection from my Lord and your Lord. I'm asking him to protect me. Min kulli mutakabbir from every single arrogant person. Lakin Musa alayhi salam knew it was his. It was Fir'aun's arrogance. From every arrogant person does not believe in the day of accountability. He didn't say, I have an army from Bani Israel and I'll face him with that. What's I going to do for it? He's living with Allah's name, Al Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dawood alayhi salam and Talut and the army of the believers when they faced the enemy of Allah in the holy lands. They faced them with a dua. They were 314, a small number. Well, al were huge, big in number. Well, Jalut and his army were huge in number. Well, Allah Azza wa Jal, he, he captures this moment. Well, Amma Barazu li Jalut wa Junudi, Qalu, Rabbana Afrig alayna sabra, wa thabbit aqdamana, wa ansurna ala al qawm al kafirin. They faced an entire army with a dua to Allah Azza wa Jal that he pour upon them patience and he give them steadfastness and he give them victory against the disbelievers. What was the result? Because Allah is Al-Mujib, the result was فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ They crushed them. Al-Hazm is to take a dry leaf and to crush it with your hand. And then you let go of it. Absolutely gone and crushed. This is what فَهَزَمُوهُمْ They were destroyed with a dua they made. بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ See what Allah says? بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ By Allah's permission. لَأَنُّ هِي سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى is Al-Mujib. And they knew he was Al-Mujib. Subhanallah. al Madina. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first arrived to al Madina, al Madina, there was a pandemic, a fever. It was affecting a lot of people. It affected Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to the point where he was saying words and he didn't even know what he was saying. As Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam solved the entire pandemic in al Madina with a dua. He said, Allahumma habib ilayna al Madina kama habbabta ilayna Makkata aw ashad wanqul humaha ila al juhfa. That in part, wanqul humaha ila al juhfa. Oh Allah azza wa jal, drive this fever that's in al Madina to a place known as al Juhfa. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam slept that night and he saw a black old woman in his dream and that she walked away and he interpreted that as being the fever that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would move away from al Madina. Allahu Akbar. Allah azza wa jalla al-mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala in an instant he can solve a problem if he decided, if he decreed subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the story of Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. You know this famous great companion radiallahu anhu. Asim radiallahu anhu, he killed one of the generals of Quraysh in the battle of Badr. His name was Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu killed him and killed a few others. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam later on, he sends Asim ibn Thabit on a da'wah mission. And he puts him as an emir and a few companions with him and they go out to a few tribes close to Mecca and so on. And uh, he sends them after the battle of Uhud. This is a while later. And as they're out on their mission, 
the disbelievers deceived them, tricked them, and they grabbed them all. This small group with them, Awsam ibn Thabit, the disbelievers grabbed them. So Quraysh, they wanted him dead because they want to boast to their people in Mecca that look, we have avenged the blood of our leaders. He killed our leader in Badr. There we have him now, we'll kill him. And yep, yani it revives the spirit once again in the people of Mecca. And there was a woman in Mecca whose son was killed by Asim, Ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. And she said, when she heard this news that they have captured him, she said, whoever brings me his head, because she wanted to drink alcohol in his head, she said, I will give him a hundred camels as a reward. So obviously, people don't know the respect and the honor of a body, and this is a Muslim, and yeah, and we're avenging the blood of our leaders. Hundreds go out for this offer. And before they killed him, because halos, they're going to kill him now. Before they killed him, he said, Allahumma shuf dua shuf people that are living with Allah's name al-Mujib. He said, Allahumma inni hamaytu deenaka awwal al-nahar. He said, Oh Allah, I defended your religion in the morning, at the beginning of this day, because he was preaching the deen of Allah to these people. Then they captured him. And then he said, Fahmi lahmi akhirahu. Allahumma harrim jasadi ala an ayamassahu kafir. He said, Oh Allah, then protect for me my flesh at the end of this day. And forbid my body that a disbeliever touch it. So they killed him. And those that wanted the reward approached his body. And just before they could get to his body, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends wasps all around his body. Like that, that bee, a wasp. Hundreds and hundreds of them, they are just circling his body. No one could get to it. And they couldn't get rid of the wasps. Quraysh and these people that wanted the reward, they said, because it's the end of the day now, it's sunset. They said, we'll sleep here the night and hopefully the next morning the wasps would be gone and we'll take his body and we'll take it to that lady and we'll take this reward. For when the night settled, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent heavy rainfall such that it created a flood. And then the next morning when the flood waters had subsided and had all gone, his body was also washed away. And until this day, no one has any ID where the body of Awsim ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu is. Allahu Akbar. Wa ibn Hajar rahimahullah, when he comments on this hadith and this incident, he says that Allah Azza wa Jal answered his dua. لأن المجيب سبحانه وتعالى. He answered his dua and he saved his body from the disbelievers. However, Allah Azza wa Jal did not prevent them from killing him. So Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, he said, because Allah wanted to honor him with martyrdom. So he allowed them to kill him. He was honored with martyrdom. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his dua and protected his body from being touched by the disbelievers. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters in Islam, a dua. A dua is the solution, the greatest weapon of the believer. A dua to al-mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single prophet, faced the difficulties of life with a dua look at zakaria alayhi salam zakaria alayhi salam at the age of 90 and his wife is barren she can't even get pregnant oh he's old as well the bones are frail they're about to break and the whole hair on the head has gone white and gray and he still makes dua. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا Allah Azza wa Jal answered his dua. And he granted him a child. يَا زَكَرِيَّا إِنَّا نُبَشِّرُكَ بِغُلَامِ He faced the difficulties of life with a dua. Even though the situation was impossible. Yani anyone who heard Zakaria would say, what are you making? What dua are you making? What child are you thinking about? Aslan. You're about, huh? you're close to your grave. Your wife is barren. What are you thinking? Like in his attitude was to say, وَلَمْ أَكُمْ بِدُعَائِكَ رَبِّ شَقِيَّ I have never ever been miserable when making dua. I have never ever given up hope when making dua. Allah Azza wa Jal answers uh, the way he answers. Allah answered him at the end of his life and gave him a child. Yunus alayhi salam, he faced his difficulty with a dua, with a dhikr. The response was Allah said, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ we responded to him and we saved him from the distress that he was in. Nuh alayhi salam. Walaqad nadana Nuh. Nuh called unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fala ni'ma al-mujibun. 
and how excellent we are in terms of responding. And Allah Azza wa responded and saved him from the calamity. Wa Ayyub alayhi salam, in his sickness of many years, making dua to Allah Azza wa at the end, Allah Azza wa Jal, fastajabna lah, fastajabna lah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his dua. Wa as we said, Dawood alayhi salam, a dua, Musa alayhi salam, faces his difficulty of Fir'aun with a dua. Wa qala Musa rabbana innaka atayta Fir'aun wa mala, rabbana tmis ala amwalihim wa shdud ala qulubihim. Qala qad ujibat da'watukuma, your dua has been answered concerning Fir'aun. Wallah azza wa jal destroyed him. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the battle of Badr, he faces this difficulty and this calamity with a dua. Allah Azza wa Jal captures the moment in Surah Al-Anfal. If تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ When you are begging your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ He responded to you. He answered to you. And then he sent a thousand angels that were coming one after the other, fighting with the believers until the disbelievers were destroyed on that day. Well, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need to send angels to fight alongside the believers. So why does he send them? He sends them as a comfort for the believers. Because when the believers then know that Allah has sent angels to their aid, it gives them comfort. It gives them comfort that we are special in the Allah Azza wa Jal to the point that he sent angels to come and protect us and fight with us. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So where is this lifestyle in our day and in our night? Where is this type of worship? A dua is a lifestyle. The reality is, most of us don't know who Allah Azza wa Jal is. We don't know who Al-Mujib is. If we knew, Wallahi, we would never ever stop making dua to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want you to think of these situations here that are coming up. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu, during the battle of Uhud, when his finger got chopped, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, his finger gets chopped. فَقَالَ hiss. يعني like this, right? Obviously, that was his immediate reaction. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, think of all this. He said to him, لَوْ قُلْتَ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ لَرَفَعَتْكَ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالنَّاسُ يَنْظُرُونَ Had you said Bismillah, if you faced this calamity of a chopped finger with dhikr Allah, with a dua, Bismillah, لَرَفَعَتْكَ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالنَّاسُ يَنْظُرُونَ the angels would have raised you. They would have lifted you up and the people would have seen this ayah and this sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mercy of Allah azza wa to the one who knows Allah azza wa is guaranteed, it's certain. But you see the idea is, this is the battle of Uhud. 70 companions are killed. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is injured. Many of the companions turned away and left to al Madina and have retreated to al Madina. It looks like the believers are going to get killed and destroyed. So what does the Nabi Sallallahu mean by angels would have come down and raised you and everyone would have looked? Yani the idea is where did the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam get these words from? Where did he get this iman and good thought in Allah Azza wa Jal during this calamity? Where did he get it from? Ayyub Alayhi Salam, he's sick, years and years of sickness. Every single inch of his body is experiencing pain. The people ran away from him because they feared what kind of disease he had. And his land and his house and his property and his children all gone and dead, finished. He had nothing except his wife that stayed next to him. And at the end of years and years of, of, of pain and suffering, he says, Anni masani adhur, oh Allah, pain has touched me. Wa anta arhamur rahimeen. And you are the most merciful. The idea, the question is, where did he get this word from? How? What iman did he have? What certainty in Allah did he have to say the words Arhamur Rahimin at this point in his life? Tayyab and the three people from Bani Israel that entered a cave, this story is known, hadith sahih, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated it. Three, they enter the cave and a huge boulder comes tumbling down from above and it seals the mouth of the cave completely. And then they look at each other and they say, Ud'u Allah bi afdali amalin amiltumuh. They said to each other, Innahu la yunajikum min hadhi al-sakhra illa an tad'u Allah bi salihi amalikum. No one is going to save you from this boulder. 
who's going to move this boulder? Asla. Who has the power to move this boulder? Asla, even today, with the technology that's today, if a huge boulder is stuck somewhere, no one can move it. And they look at each other. And how did they get the thought to say to each other, nothing is going to save us except that we ask Allah through our righteous good deeds. Yani that we supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through a righteous good deed that we have done. And then Allah, each one of them, Allahumma, Allahumma, Allahumma. And everyone mentions a good deed that he had done and asks Allah, if I was to do, if I had done this sincerely for your sake, then open this rock. Huh? And it opens. And opens. And with the third one, it opens. And they come out. Come out. Khalas, alive. Not to worry about anything. Difficulties gone, removed. Bidua. But where did this ID come from? It can only come if they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people of the cave, the same thing, the one that's mentioned in the Quran. A bunch of boys, a group of boys, they come with each other. They say, uh, Allah azza wa jalla says about them, إِذْ أَوَى الْفِتْيَةُ إِلَى الْكَهْفِ When they sought protection at the cave, they walked in there. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا ضَغْرِ عَدْدُعَى Straight away. Now that they did not think about talking to each other, what are we going to eat tonight? How are we going to survive in this cave? What's in this cave? Wow, what's going to happen with our case? How are we going to go down to the city? What are we going to wear? How are we going to... No, no, no. They're not concerned about all this. As soon as they entered, فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَهِيَّ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا Grant us. Grant us from, especially from you, a mercy. Subhanallah. Where did they get this ID from? This is because all these examples, they got the ID of turning to Allah and making dua to Allah, even though they were faced with an, int with an intense calamity because of their knowledge of Allah. That's it. They did not fear anything anymore. Nothing shakes them. Nothing would shake their faith in Allah. They are never confused. One hand, one way, the hand is straight up to Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. They knew the reality of this world. That calamities are just to be seen as messages from Allah to awaken the, uh, the tranquilized yaqeen, the tranquilized certainty that is in our hearts. You see, so my brothers and sisters in Islam, as soon as a calamity strikes, awaken the name of Allah Al-Mujib in your heart. You get up. You wash your face, you wake up, you make wudu, you pray to rak'at, you turn to Allah, you raise your hand, you seek forgiveness and you repent to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. You refresh al-iman and certainty in your heart and you keep going. First day and the second day and the third day, 10 days into your dua, one year into your dua, Allahu alam. And don't worry, just focus on a dua. Be occupied with dhikrullah, with dua more than you are occupied with the calamity itself. All these prophets, they were not occupied and busy with the calamity. When the calamity hit, they were busy bi dhikrillah. They were busy with the dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. Lan Allah Azza wa Jal is al-mujib. We need to enter the, the school of dua. This is it. It's a school. A dua is a school. And wait. Until Allah Azzawajal's relief comes to you, you would then have gained benefits in this life and in the afterlife. And this waiting period, the waiting period until relief comes, is a worship in and of itself. Subhanallah. Or remember, when you make dua to Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah Azzawajal, he said, وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ And it is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Muntaha. Yani everything leads to Allah. Everything is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, لَهُ مَقَالِيدُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ To him belongs the keys of the heavens and the earth. A dua is a school. It trains you. It nurtures you upon iman and true belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, when I tie everything to Allah, listen to this. When you tie everything to Allah, yani the one who's going to guide me is Allah. The one who's going to grant me a righteous spouse is Allah. The one who's going to cure me is Allah. The one who's going to admit me into the paradise is Allah. The one who's going to give, forgive me is Allah. The one who will protect me is Allah. The one who protects me in my sleep and during the day and protects my children and my family is Allah. The one who will give me success in my exams, in my business, in all my daily affairs is Allah. 
When you think like this, when you tie everything to Allah, and why not? Of course, everything is tied to Allah. Hatta in the dua, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would teach us, now siyati biyadik. My forelock, you see the forelock is in Allah's hand. Yani that you're controlled by Allah Azza wa Jal. And the heart of a servant is in between the two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turns it the way he wants. Everything is in Allah Azza wa Jal's hand. And at the end of the battle of Uhud, after the disbelievers had turned and left, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gathers the companions, and he praises Allah and he begins a dua. But you know how he began this dua? Very unique. He said, Allahumma laka alhamdu kulluh. To you belongs all praise. Allahumma la qabida lima basat, wa la mubasita lima qabat. He said, oh Allah, there is no one who can hold back what you spread. And no one can spread whatever you hold back. And there is no way anyone can good, God could guide someone. There is no one who could guide someone misguided. And no one could misguide someone who is guided. And no one could give what you have withheld. And no one could withhold what you give. And nothing could bring anything close to a servant if you have decreed that it's going to be far away from him. And if Allah Azza wa has brought something close to someone, nothing could remove it and move it away. Look at this. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is certain that everything exists in the hands of Allah. So the idea is this. When you tie everything to Allah, everything in your life is tied to Allah. You know what this does? Two things. Number one, if everything is tied to Allah and everything certainly does come from Him, then I cannot afford to displease Him because I've connected everything to Him. This is the peak of Yaqeen. You see how it shines? So now you realize the seriousness of falling into a sin. All your affairs are tied in His hands. It's not appropriate that you displease Him. And I'll give you a, a, a small example. If there's a person in worldly life, you have a, a business dealing with, let's say, and a lot of your work is tied with him. You know what happens? Your relationship, how it becomes? That if you do say or do anything that you think might have displeased him, you're very quick to message him the end of the night. Brother, sister, Allah, I did not mean what I said. Or I did not mean what I do. Uh, yani, please forgive me and please if there's anything I can do to make up for what uh, this is because if you've tied a lot of your work with someone you need to make sure that the relationship's always good so even if you think you said or did something to displease him you're quick to rush to seek his forgiveness and fix it up طيب, imagine, when all your affairs are tied to him subhanahu wa ta'ala why don't we have this kind of attitude look at your day and your night is there something that you think you might have displeased Allah Azza wa with? Then rush to al-istighfar wa tawbah. You cannot afford to displease Allah Azza wa Jal. If all your affairs are tied to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see what it does? When you believe in Allah's name, al-mujib, and that he responds, and all my affairs are tied directly in his hand, subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I need to make sure now and be careful that I never displease him. And if I did something wrong, I'm quick to get up and seek Allah Allah's forgiveness. And the second thing it does, since everything is tied to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order for him to respond and answer my dua, which are going to be many, I have to please him. And that is done by worshipping him, implementing his commands. Allah Azza wa he says, قُلْ مَا يَعْبُؤُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْلَا دُعَاءُكُمْ This is Allah's word. This is what Allah says. Allah Azza wa Jal said, Allah Azza wa Jal would not have cared about you. مَا يَعْبَؤُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي Allah would not have cared about you. He would not have loved you had it not been for your worship. Your worship is what will earn you Allah's love and care and compassion. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. From Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then, yalla, you begin to worship and put effort in that. Salah to attending lessons or memorizing Quran or fasting or sadaqat and all the good deeds that we know about. See why I told you dua is a school? It changes you forever. Once you make it a lifestyle, it changes your halals. Your affairs are tied in his hands. Don't displease him and start worshipping him to earn his love and his care for you. This is why calamities are from, the among, from among the greatest gifts that Allah Azza wa Jal could give a servant.
Because calamities, they force a dua to come out of a heedless person. It forces it. Even from a kafir, it forces it. As Allah Azza wa Jal described, that if they were in a situation of the ocean and huge, large waves were to come on them, Allah said about kuffar, they will make dua, not just any kind of dua, a sincere dua, and Allah would save them. Why? Because the dua was sincere. That's how scared they were when they were in the ocean faced by these wave, these monstrous waves. فَإِذَنْ الْكَلَامِرِي forces a dua to come out of a heedless person. The one who doesn't want to make dua, and a calamity comes upon him, the message from Allah to such a person is make dua. Don't rush to anyone. Make dua. Well, subhanAllah, sometimes a calamity is prolonged. Relief doesn't come very quick and soon as you think. Why? لأن this person still hasn't learned to turn to Allah Azza wa Jal. This is why Abu Rajab rahimahullah, he said, sometimes a calamity could prolong and relief is delayed upon a servant. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal continues to give him time that he lose hope in those around him. His heart first was with him. He's going to solve it for me. I've got my hopes in him. A year goes by, he couldn't do anything. I can't rely on him anymore. I lost trust and hope in him. Move to someone. Until you learn to lose hope in every single person. And the only thing in front of you remains Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then be ithnillah. Now you have learned your lesson during your calamity. Sometimes you need to enter the school of dua for two days. Sometimes you got to go in there for a week. Sometimes a year, sometimes 10 years, Allahu Alam. And that it's not your concern how Allah manages your affairs. And to just enter the school of a dua, وخلص. don't worry, Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala can hear you. And he will respond the way that is befitting to you as he wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. And yani, yani, huwa by far, this is the greatest, uh, you know, yani, the greatest way in how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers a dua is the one that he doesn't give you what you want straight away. One of the greatest forms in how Allah answers your request is by giving you what you asked for at a later time. That way, you did not only get what you asked for, but you also, during this entire period, sins are forgiven, raised ranks in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal, and so many other benefits that you have no idea about. With dua that you made, this is engaged in a worship. And the reward that you took for all this was sabr that you learned through all this, well yaqeen that you developed through all this, and your iman being nurtured through all this, that was much better than just being given what you wanted. Look at Ayyub alayhi salam. Ayyub alayhi salam when he's sick and he makes dua 18 years, Allahu alam longer less, but the idea was many years of suffering. All this time is an opportunity for him. At the end, when Allah Azza wa Jal gave him shifa, it was very simple. But there was a means, right? He said to him, Urqud bi rijlik. Urqud bi rijlik. Hada mughtasalun baridun wa sharab. He gave him a medicine that was uh, external and internal. Just like, ha, yeah. today you go, there's a, a cream you wipe externally, and there's something you take orally, internal. He gave him this water. He said to him, Urqud bi rijlik. Strike your foot on the floor, and some water gushed out. Hada mughtasal. Make ghusl with it. Apply this water on your skin from the outside. Washarab and drink from it. And he got up as though nothing had happened to him. But you see, this entire time of his calamity, Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in Surah Sad, Inna wajadnahu sabira. We found him to be patient all along. Ni'ma al-abd, how excellent of a slave he is. Innahu awab. Surely he is one of those who always continuously turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it now that better for the servant? That he went through this calamity for so many years. And Allah would say about him, he earned the rank of as sabirin And then he gave him what he wanted at the end. Now compare this to if he gave him what, what he wanted initially. The entire opportunity of a sabr would have went and uh, so many other things. For now, compare this to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he records the dua of prophets in the Quran, is to teach you and I that even prophets 
even prophets couldn't live without this great worship of a dua. This is why. This is why the, the stories of a dua are here. To tell you that, yes, they were salihin. They were righteous people. They were the closest and most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even then they made dua. Fanta, who are you? Not to continuously make dua and to turn away from this grand worship of a dua. Subhanallah. How Allah azza wa jal teaches us things. And you know, yani, there are people that assume that stories of answered dua, this is only for prophets, you know. They're the ones that have stories of answered dua. Was Salaf rahimahumullah, those the righteous, the pious, they're the ones that have the stories of accepted dua. Heck, like you read about Sheikh Al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he had kidney stones. He went and made tawaf, he made dua, and at the end of his tawaf, the kidney stones came out of his body. Allahu Akbar. People like that, as Salaf rahimahumullah, they're the ones that their dua is accepted. We don't have anything. Now that's wrong. This is absolutely incorrect to think like this. This is why in the stories of the prophets, when Allah Azza wa Jal would say that he answered the dua of Yunus, for example, when he was in the uh, belly of, of the whale, Allah Azza wa Jal would say, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ We answered him, we responded to him, we saved him from calamity, then Allah would say, listen, this is for you and I, the, the end part is for you and I. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ and in the exact same manner, we also save the believers. That opens the opportunity for you and I. Or even Ayyub alayhi salam. When you thought that he's in an impossible situation, no way he could be cured. Allah azza wa jal would say how he responded to him. And then Allah would say, وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا And we gave him back his family, his wealth. You see, Allah azza wa jal replaces the losses as a mercy. From us to him. Then at the end of the ayah, that was for him. What about for us? وَذِكْرَى لِلْعَابِدِينَ And this story of Ayyub should be a dhikra, a reminder to al-abideen, to those who worship Allah Azza wa Jal. It opens the door once again for all of us. That even if you had a chronic illness that cannot be cured, Allah Azza wa Jal in his hand is a shifa He's a shafi subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's normal. This is the normal matter between Allah and his slaves that he answers them. Astajib lakum. I will respond to each and every single one of you. Say, say to the people, preach to them that it is Allah who would save you from it and from every single calamity other than this. Some people think a dua is supposed to be like a magic pill. I take it, hey, drink some water after it, and whatever I asked for should come down immediately. So if it doesn't, I give up. I asked him. Nothing happened. Hmm. Wallahi, if a dua was like this, we would have destroyed ourselves. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Isra, Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرْ this is a reality. Allah knows us more than we know ourselves. You know what he said about us? You want the dua to be a magic pill? Look what Allah said about us. He said the human being sometimes makes dua for evil. The human being sometimes makes dua, evil dua against himself. Yani when he's angry and in other situations, he could make dua against himself. Meaning just as he makes dua, makes good dua for himself, he sometimes also makes bad dua against himself. We don't know the good from the bad. We don't. You don't want that dua to be a magic pill. No, you do not want this. We don't know what's good and what's bad. This is why we're taught something known as dua ul istikhara. You pondered over dua al-istikhara from the beginning. What are you saying? It? Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi'ilmik. I seek the goodness from you by your knowledge. Lain al-istikhara comes from the word khair. Khair means goodness. Wa istikhara means asking Allah for goodness. That if you know what's good, why are you asking him then? Ah, this is a proof that you don't know what's good. 
وَأَسْتَقْدِرُكَ بِقُدْرَتِكَ And I seek ability from you by your power. وَتَعْلَمْ وَلَا أَعْلَمْ Fast forwarding it. يعني. And you have knowledge and I do not have knowledge. You don't have knowledge at all. Subhanallah. For these are matters that we are supposed to know about a dua. What's the time? When's Adhan al Isha? Seven minutes left? Okay. So, يعني, final part, inshallah, two more parts to, to discuss. We've spoken about Allah's name, Al Mujib. We've discussed stories. We've said to you, my brothers and sisters in Islam, that each and every single one of you here must have stories in a dua. What's your story in a dua? What is your story in a dua? What Everyone is supposed to have a story with Allah Azza wa Jal concerning a dua that He answered it for him. Yani really, inta, the most deprived person among us is the one who cannot relate a success he has in life with a dua he made. What are you living? All your affairs came through a dua and your worship to Allah Azza wa Jal, and you cannot relate and tie them with each other. You have to have stories. And what does this do? When you have a lot of stories about answered dua in your life, it builds a yaqeen in your heart. It builds certainty in Allah. Therefore, if someone was to come to cause you doubt in Allah Azza wa Jal, you'd flick this person off. What are you talking about? Oh, no, I've experienced, I've made dua, Allah has answered me. And they are coming to cause me doubt in Allah? Yalla, move. Yeah, and I'll tell you something. Let's say today in this weed world of science that we live in let's say someone tomorrow comes up with a new report and a new study that says your parents are actually not your parents always rubbish like this comes out at the male and female but actually there's another gender don't things surprisingly come out like this so don't be surprised that a study might come out and say your actual parents that gave you birth are not really your parents if this study came out would you be convinced? Would you? No. Why? Because you experienced mother and father and what it is. You've seen your father and who he is. You've seen your mother and who she is. You've seen the care and the compassion and what they've done in your life and the sacrifice. And they are coming to tell me there's no father and mother in my life. Take this study and move away. So the one who has stories concerning a dua who can cause him doubt in Allah Azza wa Jal? No one. You will, never be, you will never reach that stage بإذنillah, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to keep us steadfast but you need to have stories make a dua and success comes tie it to the dua every day you're eating every day Allah is providing for you that's because of a dua that you've made it is it's a dua otherwise remember كلكم جائعون فاستطعموني أطعمكم so then you say yes I made dua to Allah to provide for me and Allah is providing for me today and I'm being provided for. Ah, even this is because Al-Mujib. It's because he answered the dua. It wasn't my strength or my power or my ability or my experience or my whatever it is. All these are means, all these are secondary. The primary reason was Allah Azza wa Jal Al-Mujib that answered your dua and he was able to do such a thing. Tayyip, the conditions and the manners of an accepted dua. Very quickly, the first matter. As Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, حضور القلب وجمعيته بكليته على المطلوب. That's the first matter and first condition of an accepted dua to al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> that your heart be present while making dua. وجمعيته بكليته. Meaning that your entire heart must be concerned with one matter. And that is a dua. Don't be distracted. This is what it means. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُ دُعَاءً مِنْ قَلْبٍ غَافِلٍ لَاهٍ That Allah Azza wa Jal does not answer, لَا يَسْتَجِيب He does not respond to a dua that comes from a heedless, distracted heart. طيب, heedless, غافل. How do you avoid being a غافل in your dua? Because if your heart is heedless, your dua is going to go unanswered. So you need to avoid ghafil. You need to avoid being heedless. How do you do that? Huh. When you make dua and you do not acknowledge Allah's greatness and Allah's mercy and the fact that Allah is the provider, if you do not acknowledge these matters and you're doubting them, your heart is heedless concerning Allah. 
So avoiding the quality of ghafil is when you make dua, you are absolutely certain that the one you are making dua to, all your affairs are tied in his hands. That's number one. So when you say, Allah maghfirli, oh, certain. There is no one else I could even be asking maghfirah from. I am certain he forgives. I do not doubt it. If you have an ounce of doubt, you're ghafil. You're heedless. And the other thing you need to keep away from is lahin, from distraction. If your heart is distracted, dua is unanswered. How do you avoid distraction? When you make dua and you don't know what you're saying, you're distracted. Even make dua you understand. Make dua you understand. Otherwise, saying words, you have no idea what you're saying. This is distraction. You're just saying words. Well, you don't even understand what you're saying. Even avoid all this until, and this promotes and encourages a person to learn dua on Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Learn the dua of the Quran. Now make an effort. This we said the dua is a school. So enter the school and learn al adiyah Learn them and what they mean. And then start to ask Allah azza wa jal through these dua. That's the first thing. Avoid heedlessness. Avoid distraction. Second matter. وَصَادَفَ وَقْتًا مِنْ أَوْقَاتِ الْإِجَابَةِ السِّتَّةِ And it comes during the six times of an accepted dua. The first being the last third of the night. عِنْدَ الْأَذَانِ Immediately after al-adhan. There is an accepted dua immediately after al-adhan. As the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. The third time is between the adhan and iqamah. So this, adha, this dua that comes straight after the adhan is the one where it's before you've even prayed sunnah uh, sunnah yani as soon as you finish allahumma rabb hadhihi da'wat at tamam was salat qaimah was salat ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the other adhkar then fasal ta'ta quickly make a dua then and there then pray your sunnah and then there's another the third time is between the adhan and the iqamah is an accepted dua why because in the in the adhan there was hayya ala was salat come to the prayer so you came you came. You answered Allah's call. So Allah will answer your call. For this is a third time. The fourth time is الصلوات المكتوبة, At the end of the prayer. Just before you conclude a salat. Just before you make taslim. An opportunity for an accepted dua. You, this is an incredible time. This time at the end of a salat. Do you understand how huge this time is? I'll tell you why. Because this dua at the end of a salat is coming after you have done all this. You've made wudu. Or faced the qibla. And you've began your salat with Allahu Akbar. You've declared the greatness of Allah. You stood facing Allah. You recited his word in a salat. You made a ruku'ah and glorified Allah in a ruku'ah. You got up and then you praised him. Rabbana wa lakal hamd. Then you sat and you made sujood and you glorified Allah in your sujood and you humbled yourself to Allah Azza wa Jal. Then you repeated a second rak'ah and a third rak'ah and a fourth, fourth rak'ah. Then you finally sat for at tashahud This is a humble, submissive, obedient sinning. And then you said at tahiyatu lillah. All greetings and prayers and good things belong to Allah Azza wa Jal. And then you prayed upon Rasulullah. Allah, when you said, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad, and then you bear witness, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Now make dua before you make taslim. Allahu Akbar. You've done all this. At this moment, a dua is precious. You have now acknowledged your humility to Allah. You've glorified Him, you've made tasbih, you've made everything you need for a dua. Just before you leave a salat, make a dua. This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to make a dua at this time. To say, Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathira. In another narration, kabira. Wa innahu la yaghfiru dhuruba illa ant faghfirli maghfiratan min indika warhamni. Innaka anta ghafuru rahim. The fifth time, عند الصعود الإمام يوم الجمعة. When the imam ascends on the member uh, for salat al-jumu'a. All the way until a salat Jumu'ah ends. So you have an opportunity where when the Imam sits between the two khutab, that's one time. At the end of the khutbah when the Imam is making dua and the dua that you can make in a salat. These are the three times and what is referred to when the Imam ascends the mimbar. The sixth time, the last hour after Asr, right, of, of, the, of the Friday. These are six times. The third matter, tadarru' wa 
to have humility and be desperate for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and forgiveness. Allah azza wa jalla says, Udu Rabbakum tadarruan wa khufya. When you call unto Allah, you must call with an attitude of tadarruan. What is tadarruan? Tadarruan, it comes from the word adhira. What dhira is the udder of a cattle. You know, يعني, the udder of the cattle where the milk is and the little baby animals would come and they will suckle the milk from there. Do you see that child, that, uh, the, the, the baby animal? When it comes to its mother, it's desperate for that milk. It cannot live without this milk. Tadarru'an is an udder. The udder implies desperation. You cannot live without it. Even the attitude of tadarru'an as though if I do not make dua to Allah, I will perish and I'll be destroyed. I cannot live. Without a dua to Allah Azza wa Jal, then your attitude now becomes different. When you're making dua to Allah, look, without this dua, without Allah, and you're gonna die spiritually and physically. The fourth matter is taqbal al da'i al qibla, facing the qibla. That was Sunnah al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in dua al istisqa. Wa kana ala tahara upon wudu. The next thing, wa rafa'a yadayhi ila Allah. To raise your hand to Allah Azza wa Jal. There are many forms. The most common form is to join the hand and face your face. Right? The other form is to join the hands together and face them up to the sky. This is another form of a dua. And this is an image. This is an image of humility of a person that is begging. This is a person that is in desperate need. And in real desperate times, such as in prayer for rain, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would raise his hand until the whiteness of his armpits would be seen and apparent for the Sahaba to see. And sometimes during al-istisqa, he would put his, yani, his hands, uh, the face, the, the, the palm of the hands would face the earth and the top of the hand would face the sky. This was also a form of raising the hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These forms are mentioned. Uh, Abu Rajab, rahimahullah, he mentions them in his book, Jam' al-Uloom wal-Hikam in hadith number 10. You'll find them there. Then after raising the hand, starting the dua with praising Allah azza wa jal. And then before your dua, you begin with istighfar and tawbah. قَدَّمَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ حَاجَتِهِ التَّوْبَةَ وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ and then dakhala ala Allah wa alaha alayhi fil mas'ala. And then repetition in your dua. Repeating your dua. Right? Rabbana, oh Rabbana, oh Rabbana. Repeat your dua. Yani look, even the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us things, these things in certain manners. Like Salat al Janazah, for example. In dua, in Salat al Janazah, there's a dua after the third takbirah dua that we make. You know what we say? We say, Allahumma ghfir li hayyina wa mayyitina. Forgive for those that are alive among us and those that have died and the one that is present and the one that is absent but that already was included in hayyina then and the small one and the big one but that was already included in the absent and the present and the male and the female that was already included in hayyina and all of those what's the idea of all this then repetition and this is teaching us repetition. Allah Azza wa Jal loves the repetition with dua. And then the other matter is what tamallakahu attamalluku fi dua. Attamalluk is loving and gentle, peaceful words with extreme desperation when you make dua. Yani you know, you know Sayyidul Istighfar. How does Sayyidul Istighfar begin? Okay, watch this. Allahumma anta rabbi. La ilaha illa anta. خلقتني وأنا عبدك وأنا على عهدك ووعدك ما استطعت أعوذ بك من شر ما صنعت أبوء لك بنعمتك علي I acknowledge your favor upon me وأبوء بذنبي and I acknowledge my sin then what do we say at the end فاغفر لي فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت in this entire dua of سيد الاستغفار where's the dua part فاغفر لي that's it two words so what's the point of the entire thing from the beginning to the end I could have just said فاغفر لي there's a difference between faghfirli and all this Sayyidul Istighfar. This Sayyidul Istighfar, the beginning of it, this is what is known as At-Tamalluqu Fid-Dua. Right? This is what is known as At-Tamalluqu Fid-Dua. At-Tamalluqu Fid-Dua. Loving, gentle, peaceful words. Speak, speak, talk, talk to Allah Azza wa Jal. Yani Zakariya alayhi salam, inni wahana al-azmu minni. My bones are weak. Tayyib. And my head has gone white. Allah knows this. But enter talk. 
توك توك الله عز وجل is listening he can hear and I have never given up hope when it comes to Allah knows about this I've never given up hope when it comes to dua Allah knows this but talk these matters talk about your intention to Allah عز وجل talk what you want this is a real conversation. Allah can hear. This is why sometimes the ulama, uh, uh, ulama would mention that a, see, a silent dua is better than a loud dua. A dua in where you cannot hear your own self is better than a dua you can hear yourself. You know why? Because the one who makes a dua silently is a person who really believes Allah can even hear him even though it's silent. And that this is stronger for al-iman. This is a proof that such a person knows and believes that Allah Azzawajal can hear him and knows what he's saying, even though he himself cannot hear himself. This is a, a stronger level. This is why Allah Azzawajal, he praised this quality for Zakaria alayhi salam when he said, إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً A silent dua. No one could hear him. He couldn't even hear himself. طيب, how did Allah know? So he mentioned that. So this is why when Allah said, If Nada Rabbahu Nida and Khafiya, Allah Azzawajal does wasn't in this ayah, he wasn't just telling us what dua he made. Allah was praising him for the fact he made a silent dua. Why did he make a silent dua? Because he's absolutely certain that Allah Azzawajal can hear him. And there we go, Allah heard him, and it's recorded in the Quran for you and I to draw inspiration from it. And then you make dua, hope and fear in Allah Azza wa Jal, fearing him and hoping him in, in his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then tawassala ilayhi bi asma'ihi wa sifatihi wa tawheedihi. And then you make a dua with Allah's names and his attributes. And you seek a way to Allah through a tawheed, right? The greatest form of, of a tawassul is to seek a way to Allah Azza wa Jal through your tawheed. And this is why in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he heard a man say, Allahumma inni as'aluka. Oh Allah, I ask you. Bi'anni ashhadu annaka anta Allahu la ilaha illa anta al-ahadu as-samadu al-lazhi lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufwan ahad. He said, oh Allah, I ask you by the fact, I ask you by the fact that I bear witness that you are Allah. There is none worthy of worship but you. The only Lord, independent of all his creation, a summit, the one who doesn't have any children and no one gave birth to him, and there is no one equal to him. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he heard this man say this, so he hasn't even asked yet, but he made a dua to Allah through his tawheed in Allah. Because this man says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Use a tawheed to your advantage. Make a dua to Allah through your tawheed. It's the greatest manner that you have ever adopted in your life. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, This man has asked Allah with a name. That if he was to request right now, إِذَا دُعِيَ بِهِ أَعْطَى وَإِذَا سُئِلَ بِهِ أَعْطَى وَإِذَا دُعِيَ بِهِ أَجَابِ If he was to call unto Allah now, Allah would give him. If he was to request from Allah, Allah azza wa jal would give him. And then from the matters of uh, accepted and the conditions of, of, of uh, the manners in a dua is to give a sadaqah. وَقَدَّمَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ دُعَائِهِ sadaqah To give a sadaqah. And these are the matters that make a dua accepted. And we will uh, يعني, stop for al-adhan. Yalla, khair, inshallah. Tayyip, we're going to stop here, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grant us uh, forgiveness and he uh, يعني, grant us his mercy. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. And to forgive our shortcomings and to make us subhanahu wa ta'ala recognize his name al-mujib and all his names subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innahu waliyu thalika wal qadiru alayhu wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.